There was a saying among the Jews that if you wanted to get rich, you should go to Galilee. Galilee was the breadbasket of the region, much more green and fertile than Judea. The cost of living was also lower. Olives grew there in great abundance, along with almonds and pistachios and vegetables. There were oxen, sheep, goats, grapes, wheat, barley, figs, honey, milk, and eggs, everything needed for life. It was also a crossroads area, and therefore a center of trade, which made it easy to sell your produce. But those living in Galilee were looked down on by those living in Judea. Galilean fool was a common expression. The Pharisees called the simple, hard-working Jews of Galilee, as well as of other areas, the Am Haaretz, which means people of the land. But in the mouths of the Pharisees, this was a negative expression. It meant people who were not strict enough in observing the rabbinical law. As the religious leaders said in John chapter 7, verse 49, this crowd which does not know the law is accursed. But this was the same group in the population that was the most open to the gospel message of Jesus. If the Galileans were looked down on, the people of Nazareth were looked down on even more. As Nathaniel said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was a tiny village. Only 20 to 30 families lived there, maybe 200 to 300 people. There was not even a city wall. Nazareth is not mentioned in most of the lists of towns in Galilee at the time. Even the archaeology shows it was a poor village. When Jesus introduced himself as Jesus of Nazareth, people would have said, Jesus, is nice to meet you. Now let's see, that Nazareth, where is it exactly? Do you know what the earliest name given to Christians by others was? Nazarenes. Originally, this was a term of mockery referring to Jesus' origins in the tiny town of Nazareth. This is still the Jewish name for Christians today, Notzrim, Nazarenes. The name Christian was first used many years later for believers living outside of Israel. But the early believers saw deeper meaning behind this name, Notzrim, Nazarenes. In Hebrew, Nazareth, Natseret, sounds like Netzer, which means a branch like the branch of a tree. One of the prophetic names of the Messiah was the Netzer, the branch. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says, A shoot will come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch, a Netzer, from its roots, will bear fruit. Have you ever wondered how a branch can grow from the roots of a tree? This is how an olive tree propagates itself it puts up little shoots from its roots. Ordinarily, the farmer will cut off these shoots. But if an olive tree is chopped down for some reason, it can replace itself with one of the little shoots or branches growing from the tree's roots. This is the picture that appears in this verse of Scripture. The royal line of David had been chopped down, like an olive tree. There was no more Davidic king in Israel. But the Netzer, the Messiah, will grow from the roots of the tree and reestablish the royal line. According to Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, Jesus lived in Nazareth to fulfill this prophecy. It was the custom for boys to learn a trade from their fathers. In those days, everyone helped with the farming and so we can be sure that Jesus was familiar with wheat and barley farming. But Joseph also had a specialized trade. In the Bible, Joseph's trade is called tekton in Greek. Tekton means a builder or construction worker. In Europe, since most houses are made out of wood, this word was translated carpenter. But in Israel, most houses are built out of stone. This means that Yeshua and Yosef Jesus and Joseph, were actually stone workers. This tells us something about the appearance of Jesus. He was picking up stones all day, which means he was a strong man, not like the effeminate pictures you often see of him. And since the roofs of houses were made of wood, he probably also did some carpentry. Jesus' teachings reflect his familiarity with farming, 
carpentry, and stonework. The house built on the rock or the sand, the beam in the eye, yokes and plows, two women grinding at the mill, which was made from stone, the sower sowing his seed. But how could Jesus and Joseph get enough work in the tiny, poor village of Nazareth? Poor people can't afford to hire workers to build their houses. They build them themselves. So where did Jesus and Joseph get work? Most of us imagine Nazareth was a quiet village miles and miles away from the nearest town. But Nazareth was just four miles away from Sephoris, the regional capital of Galilee. Four miles was just a short walk in those days, and there was lots of work in Sephoris for construction workers. Just at the time that Joseph came back from Egypt, Herod Antipas was looking for workers to beautify his capital. Yosef and Yeshua could have walked there every day to work, or perhaps they made things in Nazareth that they sold in Sephoris. And for Mary, Sephoris was probably her market town. The archaeology shows us that there were many Jews living in Sephoris at the time. More than 30 Jewish ritual baths have been found. But there were also wealthy Hellenized Jews and Gentiles living here. It was an important government center with soldiers marching in and out. Here Jesus was exposed to Gentiles, Romans, and Hellenized Jews. He grew up with a much bigger picture of the world than most of us ever realized. It's interesting to wonder if Jesus in his human nature already knew that the message he would bring was for all people, not only the Jews. He probably also saw his first crucifixions here. We can only wonder when, in his human nature, he became aware of his own destiny on a cross. The next thing we hear of Jesus is when he was baptized by John in the desert. John came claiming the same verse as the Essenes at Qumran. In Isaiah 40, the voice of one crying in the desert, make ready the way of the Lord. Maybe he had even been raised in the desert by Essenes. At the place John was baptizing, near Jericho, the Jordan River is a tiny little thread of green in a vast desert landscape. The deep Arava Canyon, below sea level, is the deepest on the surface of the earth. Huge cliffs rise up on either side. In the middle of this large canyon, there is another, much smaller canyon where the river flows, followed on either side by a narrow band of green. There was something about this vast desert wilderness that has attracted religious types through the ages. Many fantastic miracles of God had taken place here. The judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, the parting of the Jordan River, the conquest of Jericho, the ascension of Elijah into heaven. Even many of the false messiahs called their followers here into the desert, claiming they would show some great sign. Something about this dramatic and dangerous landscape makes it easier to believe that God really is coming to judge all mankind. John certainly believed it. About the coming messiah, he said, His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is imagery from the threshing floor, a flat area of rock with a stone wall around it where wheat was crushed with a threshing sled. This was done to break the kernel of the wheat, the part you eat, out of its husk. After threshing, the grain was thrown up into the wind with a big wooden rake. The kernels of wheat, since they were heavier, fell down first. All the rest, the chaff, since it was lighter, blew a little further away. After you did this for a while, you had two separate piles of wheat and chaff. The wheat you would gather up to eat, the chaff you would get rid of, sometimes by burning it. This is how John pictured the Messiah, throwing the grain up into the wind, which in Hebrew is the same word as spirit. The ministry of Messiah was to stir people up, 
to throw them up into the wind of the Spirit, until all the good and the bad are separated, and the bad burned with unquenchable fire. John's disciples also shared these fiery visions of the coming Messiah, including a small group from Galilee who would later leave John to become disciples of Jesus. On his relationship to the Messiah, John was very clear. He said in Luke chapter 3, I am not fit to untie the tongue of his sandals. John says he's not worthy to be the disciple of the Messiah. The idea of baptism was not new to John. Ritual immersion was all the rage at the time. This immersion was best done in a natural body of water, like a stream or river. But if this was not available, a mikvah bath could also be used. Today there is usually only one mikvah bath for an entire Jewish neighborhood. But in Jerusalem, in the time of Jesus, many of the mansions had two in each basement. A few people immersed themselves every day. A mikvah bath was not used for getting the dirt off. Regular bathtubs were used for that. A mikvah was used only for ritual immersion. When did someone have to be immersed? A mikvah was used for purification from different kinds of impurities mentioned in the Bible, especially in Leviticus chapter 15. These include a woman's time of the month, giving birth, unusual bodily discharges, marital relations, and certain functions of the priests. Not only did the individual become unclean, but often any object the person touched or sat on also became unclean. Remember the Zaba woman? The Gospel of Mark mentions this custom. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they immerse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe such as the immersing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. A mikvah bath was also required in the conversion of a Gentile to Judaism. It was this last use of the mikvah for conversion that eventually led to Christian baptism as a sign of conversion. In Jewish conversion, immersion in a mikvah was the symbol of purification from the uncleanness of the Gentile nations. It was in this sense of purification that John also preached baptism, purification from sins, a baptism of repentance. There was something unusual about this, though. The normal way of obtaining cleansing from sin was in the temple, through sacrifice. But now people were coming to John in the desert to repent and be cleansed of their sins. Why? Many were upset by the compromises of the Sadducees and the priests with the Romans. They, along with John, recognized that spiritually something was wrong. The traditional religious practices of the temple were simply not enough to guarantee a right relationship with God. Something more was needed than just going through the motions. A right relationship required genuine repentance and a change in behavior. As John put it, bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. But Jesus had never sinned. Why did he have to be baptized by John? This is a question that has upset many interpreters. But when we understand it in its original Jewish setting, it's not a problem. Baptism was for those who had already repented. They had already been made right with God on the inside through repentance. All that was left was to purify the outside of the body through baptism. Jesus was already in right relationship with God. He only needed a purification of the body. One of the uses of a ritual bath was for the purification of priests. A new high priest took a ritual bath before he began his ministry, after which he was anointed with oil. Jesus' baptism was like the ritual bath of a new high priest, to prepare him to begin his public ministry. And how was Jesus anointed? 
by the Holy Spirit that descended on him like a dove. Why do all the Gospels mention the same description, like a dove? Because it was important in identifying Jesus as the Messiah. One of the most important messianic prophecies in the Bible is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, that is, on the Messiah. The rabbis identified this with Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, The Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Hovering, that is to say, like a bird. For the Spirit to descend on Jesus as a dove, showed that he is the chosen Messiah of God. To emphasize the importance of this event, a voice spoke from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am pleased. The idea of a voice speaking from heaven seems strange to us today, but it was not unusual to the Jewish people. They even had a name for it. It was called a bat coal, the daughter or echo of the voice of God. The rabbis recorded several times when they heard a bat coal speaking to them. They believed the voice of prophecy had died out with the last of the prophets of the Old Testament. The bat coal had replaced the voice of prophecy, no longer the direct voice of God, but just the echo of his voice. The New Testament agrees with this. Three times a bat coal spoke in the ministry of Jesus, at his baptism, at the transfiguration, and during his last week in Jerusalem. Thanks for listening. In the next section of this seminar, section 3E, we'll be looking at the first miracles in Jesus' ministry and how the wedding customs of the time are very important to understand many of Jesus' parables. This is a favorite teaching in our seminars. Don't miss it.